Volcanoes are beautiful, but they can be incredibly dangerous. They can cause massive destruction, including lava flows, ash clouds, and pyroclastic flows. But they can also create gem and mineral deposits. So they're very interesting to the geologist. Did you know that there are different kinds of volcanoes? And some are far more dangerous than others. Some literally explode and others just ooze sloopy thick lava all over the place. Some shoot out cinders red hot with toxic gases and ash clouds. And like I say, some can form gold and silver deposits and or gemstones. In addition to the different kinds of volcanoes, there are a lot of different kinds of volcanic features or uh, things that grow out of these volcanoes. So let's explore the fascinating worlds of volcanoes and their characteristics. I'm Chris Ralph, the professional prospector, and today we're talking about volcanoes, dangerous, their characteristics, and their mineral deposits. We'll take a closer look at the unique characteristics of each type of volcano and how they form. We'll also delve into the geology behind volcanic eruptions and their dangers and the impact they can have on surrounding communities. Volcanoes are one of the most powerful and awe-inspiring natural phenomena on our planet. But with beauty comes danger. From deadly lava flows to toxic gases, we'll take a look at the hazards that volcanoes pose to the people and the environment. We'll also look at some of the most devastating volcanic eruptions in history and the lessons that we can learn from them. If you are at all curious about the science behind these incredible geologic wonders, this video is for you. So join me as we explore the danger of volcanoes and the importance of being prepared. Let's start by looking at the various types and their dangers. There are three types of volcanoes. Cinder cones, also called spatter cones, composite volcanoes, sometimes called strata volcanoes, and shield volcanoes. Now, you know, if you look this stuff up, there are some geologists that will call certain volcanic features a separate volcano type. So you may find that some uh, geologists will say there's two different kinds of volcanoes or three different kinds, four different kinds, five different kinds. It, it, it all depends on how you count the volcanic features versus what's actually a type of volcano. We'll talk all about these and how they affect the shape of volcanoes, the dangers that may exist from them and what they can form in the way of mineral deposits and that sort of thing. First, we're going to look at the cinder cones. Now these are pretty simple uh, types of volcanoes. They have straight sides and are typically less than about five, six hundred feet high. Most are made up of fragments of scoria. Now scoria is a kind of volcanic rock that's filled with bubbles of gas, of air, basically. And they basically are volcanic foam. In these types of volcanoes, the scoria is erupted into the air in a kind of soft, semi-liquid state, and it hardens in the air and then cools as it lands. Cinder cones are the most common type of volcano in the world. They may look like an idealized depiction of a volcano because they are steep-sided, conical hills that usually have a prominent crater at the top. Because they are piles of loose fragments, cinder cones are, have very little strength and are easily washed away by erosion if they're subject to that. Cinder cones have a low level of danger unless you get up too close. Sometimes they can emit toxic gases and again, the, if you get too close, you can ex be exposed to those. But let's look at some photos for a further explanation of cinder cones. This is a cinder cone volcano. It's basically a volcano made up of individual little cinders and rocks and pieces. There may be some sheets of solidified material in there that help to hold it together, but it's old enough that the trees are starting to creep up the side of it and grow on it. This is a different cinder cone in central Nevada that I filmed. They really are fairly common and you'll see them dot the landscape in areas where there is volcanic activity or has been recently. And this is what one looks like when it's actually erupting. You can see it shooting the little red hot cinders out of the mouth of the volcano and uh, perhaps losing a little bit of uh, lava along the sides that help it hold together. But this is a cinder cone volcano in action. 
The next type we're going to look at is the stratovolcano or composite volcano. And composite volcanoes can be uh, the, really the most picturesque type of volcano with its cone shape and uh, steeper near the top and usually with that uh, depression we'll talk about later called caldera at the top. Viscosity of the lava is an important thing in volcano shape and, and formation. Uh, eruption of thick, sticky magma tends to produce steep-sided volcanoes um, when the, the thick, sticky stuff is erupted. And because it doesn't move far before it cools and solidifies, it tends to build a steep-shaped volcano. These volcanoes build up in layers every time it erupts. It, you know, it starts off with small layers and they build up with lower, more and more layers until the thing gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Sometimes they shoot out cinders, sometimes they erupt lava that flows, and they tend to be uh, basically stratified layers of all these different kinds of eruptions. That's why they call them stratovolcanoes, because the strata of the layers of the different kinds of volcanic eruptions, from cinders to lava and back and forth. Some of the layers can be lava flows and cinders, but they can also have layers of pyroclastic ash and mud flows and other sorts of things, including lava domes. That We'll talk more about domes in a minute. Composite volcanoes are active over long periods, uh, literally from tens to hundreds of thousands of years, and just erupt periodically. These volcanoes, when they get really thick mm, types of lava that don't want to move or flow at all, they can tend to be the kind that explode. Mount St. Helens that exploded in 1980 and Krakatoa that exploded in the 1880s as well as Mount Lassen over in California are all this type of volcano. The pyroclastic flows, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, are some of the most deadly kinds of eruptions that are known. Let's look at some photos of stratovolcanoes for further explanation. This diagram kind of shows how these stratovolcanoes are made up. You can see the various layers of eruptions that have happened and the volcano grows in size and it's steeply sided. This is the famous Mount Fuji in Japan. You can see it's beautiful and quite picturesque. It's built up with its steep sided and there's many layers of volcanic eruptions that have made this beautiful mountain. However beautiful, they also are incredibly dangerous. This is Mount St. Helens. It once had a nice cone shape, just like Mount Fuji, but you can see it blew its top. And the entire top of the volcano blew off. Much of it became ash and was spread over hundreds of square miles and killed a lot of people. It's growing a little dome on the inside, and we'll talk more about volcanic domes later in this video. The next type we're gonna look at is the shield volcano. And although shield volcanoes are the largest type of volcanoes on Earth, they don't have the storing steep mountainsides that the conical peaks are like you find in a stratovolcano. Instead, they're broad, uh, very gently sloped types of volcanoes. Uh, and that's where they get their name. It's kind of sort of like a warrior shield set on the ground so that it, you know, it has a broad, flat kind of a shape. These volcanoes erupt more fluid types of lava that tend to flow and in fact flow a long distance, sometimes miles from where the eruption point is. And as they flow out and flow easily, they make these gently sloped types of volcanoes. The volcanoes in Hawaii are of this type. They're built up of repeated eruptions that occur intermittently over long periods of time, up to a million years and sometimes longer. And like I say, the island of Ho islands of Hawaii are built of these types of volcano. <laughs> Mauna Loa and Kilauea, two, of, two active shield volcanoes and two of the largest active shield volcanoes on Earth are of this type. Although Mauna Loa and Kilauea are next to each other, they have separate magma systems and are independent of each other. Mauna Loa is the largest active volcano on Earth. It's measured from its base on the ocean floor. The mountain is almost 33,500 feet tall. It's nearly impossible to divert the lava from a shield volcano, and so when they do erupt, they incinerate and bury all that is in the path of their lava flow. And like I say, that lava sometimes can flow for miles. 
And also the, the ones that are in the ocean, like Hawaii, um, they flow on top of each other and sometimes uh, it's a rubbly kind of lava, lava with loose pieces. They don't always, the layers don't always weld well to each other. And so uh, periodically in the history of Hawaii, there have been segments of the island that have just slipped off into the ocean. These cause giant tidal waves. And of course, the part of the coastline that slides off into the ocean is you know, buried hundreds of feet deep under the water. Let's look at some photos for a further explanation. Here is a view of Mauna Loa in Hawaii. You can see that it's very large. It has gently sloping sides that go down in basically every direction. The lava is thin enough that it can flow easily and it can flow down the hill, like I say, literally for miles. The exact point on the mountain where the eruption comes from determines which direction it will run downhill. In 2017, Kilauea erupted and huge amounts of lava came downhill and literally destroyed hundreds of beautiful homes. Next, we're going to look at some of the various features or things that form out of volcanoes. Some geologists will call these their own separate volcanic type. Uh, it just depends on a point of view. But uh, I, I like to divide it into the three main types and then various volcanic features. I think it makes it more easy to understand. And so you don't have, because different kinds of volcanoes can have these features. They can have more than one. That doesn't mean they're different kinds of volcanoes. Anyway, we're going to talk about these features. And the first one we're going to talk about is the volcanic dome. The volcanic dome forms from an extrusion of highly thick and viscous silicic lava. This is the kind of lava that doesn't flow very well. Most domes are small and they start as, you know, basically sometimes out of highly explosive eruptions and dome building is kind of a natural follow through through that. So Mount St. Helens, when Mount St. Helens erupted, a bunch of this heavy thick lava was in, injected into the side of the mountain and it blew up. And so all the force of the mountain that was holding that stuff in was gone. And there was, but there was still the source of the magma and uh, Mount St. Helens started to build up, build up, build up a little bit of a dome that happened after the explosion. Lava domes start small and build up until eventually they may explode themselves because they become a force that can hold uh, material in underneath them. Uh, sometimes they result in these pyroclastic flows um, and they tend to occur in kind of clusters or groups. They can form within the caldera that's the depression at the top of the volcano. And actually rhyolitic, which is again a high silica type of lava, uh, rhyolitic domes can be associated with a number of different types of gold deposits. Let's take a look at some photos for further explanation. This is Mount St. Helens, and you can see that when she blew her top off, she's building in the middle a kind of little mini volcano inside where the volcano blew off. Here's more of a close-up view of the dome growing within the cup-shaped blast cone of Mount St. Helens. This is another dome. This one is from California. This diagram shows that these domes are basically the plug of where the lava is coming up from underneath. And once you have an explosion and you blow off the rest of the rock that holds things down, uh, you still have an open conduit uh, that conducts magma to the surface. And then what you do is you grow these lava domes that uh, follow in like in Mount St. Helens. Now, the ones that are associated with gold deposits are ones that usually don't quite come to the surface. Now, they are not big enough and powerful enough that they cause the explosions like Mount St. Helens, but they do grow underneath the ground and they intrude underneath and basically become long-lived heat sources. And the force of them coming up creates fractures and and faults in the ground and breaks that can allow hot water containing minerals and including gold and silver to circulate through the cracks and deposit veins and gold deposits. So we talked about domes. Let's talk next about mar and tuff rings. 
Now, Mars and Tuff Rings are low standing volcanic features with the wide kind of bowl shaped craters. They commonly have a kind of a donut profile with the, the mar in the middle sunk down and the tough ring around is the donut itself. But they can be breached, they can be you know open on one side or more. Uh, they consist of shallow dipping deposits of tuff made mostly of ash and angular pebble sized pyroclasts. A mar is a volcanic crater in which the crater lies actually below the surrounding ground. Sometimes they're filled by lakes. Tuff ring craters are usually dry. Mars and tuff rings are usually associated with diatremes. A diatreme is a funnel shaped breccia uh, pipe that's formed by an explosion, uh, uh, basically a hydrovolcanic explosion where magma comes into contact with water. And of course, that builds up steam and eventually explodes. Let's take a look at some pictures and diagrams to better explain it. Mars form by the interaction of hot magma with water in the water table. You can see that as the magma touches the water, of course, it boils and creates cracking and then lots of pressure. And eventually it blows off what's on top and opens up a path for the steam to go to the surface. This is what one looks like in real life. You can see the, uh, the circular donut shape. In the middle is the blast hole. Um, it doesn't go down very deep because a lot of the material blasted up out just falls back in. But then you can see this ring of ash around the explosion depression. And so this is a mar, that's the center. And then the tough ring is the donut shaped piece that goes around. Tuff, of course, is a, a type of volcanic debris and ash. Next is calderas. Now, calderas are the uh, collapse or depression feature that form during uh, volcanic eruptions. Uh, usually, they are found at the top of or near the top of a volcano. Uh, basically, this is the part where the lava has come out, and usually, once it's the lava is exhausted, the surface kind of depresses a little bit and then so you have the classic volcano rise to the top and then a little cup at the top. The cup is the caldera. Calderas can form in many types of volcanoes. They're differentiated on the basis of whether the eruptions that produced them were silica rich magmas that exploded and emitted large volumes of ash flow tuff like Mount St. Helens. And these, of course, are the most dangerous type, burying all the areas around them with flaming hot ash. Non-explosive types um, are the calderas that form at the summit of like shield volcanoes, like they have in Hawaii. The Kilauea crater on the island of Hawaii belongs to this type. Sometimes Kilauea is a lake also, but it's a lake of lava. Resurgent calderas, which are the largest type, basically they erupt and explode and they kind of lift back up again, are not generally associated with any individual volcanic vent, but are characterized by broad regions of ashfall and pyroclastic flow types of volcanic rocks. Uh, precious metal and vein deposits are often associated with ring fractured domes or even other types of resurgent, uh, um, resurgent caldera types because basically the uplifting of rock from underneath tends to crack and break and cause fractures in the rock that's above them. And those fractures then become the uh, conduit for mineralizing fluids to go up and create mineral deposits. The deep magma and heated rock provides a long-lived heat source that can drive epithermal type hydrothermal systems and chemical reactions that can form valuable mineral deposits. These deposits include both gold and other metals. Explosive caldera volcanoes represent an important ore forming environment for a wide range of mineral deposits including porphyry copper and polymetallic veins. If they occur underwater, like under an ocean, um, but they can also lead to volcanogenic massive sulfide deposits. Let's take a look at some photos for further explanation about these mineral deposits and calderas. Here's a diagram. It just shows that the caldera is the cup-shaped depression found at the top of a lot of volcanoes. I showed this diagram earlier. It's a cinder cone, but you can see again, just like the diagram, the depression at the top of the volcano where the material comes out. This is the caldera of Kilauea Volcano in Hawaii. 
it's filled with a lake of lava. The dark material in the in the lake is basically a floating island of solidified lava rock. This diagram shows how uh, volcanoes can lead to mineral deposits. Um, the green at the top is a stratovolcano, and then the lava down below, the magma that's uh, started to slowly solidify, uh, depending on the country rocks that it encounters on its way up, uh, can create mineral deposits. Where the magma contacts limestone, you can get scarns, and uh, then deeper down, you can get porphyry-type deposits. This is another diagram that shows how underneath the volcano, the magma can, as it slowly solidifies, create mineral deposits. The red area is the ore zone, and then the red lines are veins that would come off from the ore zone. This map shows the location of the big explosive resurgent type of calderas in Nevada. They're shown with red lines, red circles that indicate where they are. Now, not every one of these has mineral deposits associated with it, but actually a lot of them do. And it explains in part why Nevada is so rich in gold and silver. Next, we're going to take a look at super volcanoes. Now, these are volcanic centers and craters that have explosive eruptions ranked at uh, level five on the uh, explosive volcanic activity index. Now, that's probably something you're not familiar with. I'm not all that familiar with it. But just by comparison, the explosion at Yellowstone, uh, the explosive reactions there, are of this type and reach that sort of level, number eight. Mount St. Helens, which spread ash for hundreds of miles and killed a number of people, that was only a five on that scale. The Yellowstone caldera is approximately 53 by 28 miles and is considered an example of this super volcano type. These are the type of extreme and explosive eruptions that are so fantastic and so destructive that they cause literally worldwide extinction events. The explosion that basically put an end to the dinosaurs is thought by a lot of geologists to be something of this type. So next we're going to talk about pyroclastic flows. Now I mentioned a thing called a pyroclastic flow a couple of times in this video. These are incredibly deadly to anything around the volcano which emits them. They're a destructive mass of very hot ash, uh, lava fragments, and burning gases that are ejected from a volcano and typically flow downhill at average speeds of more than 60 miles an hour. They hurtle downhill, spreading out laterally under the force of gravity, sometimes with temperatures as hot as 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. The force of this moving cloud of ash and rock will flatten trees and buildings in its path. The hot gases and high speeds make them incredibly lethal and anything that's flammable will just be incinerated, including living organisms. The cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum were destroyed in Italy in 79 AD by a pyroclastic flow and thousands of lives were lost. The 1902 eruption of Mount Pele on the island of Martinique in the Caribbean destroyed the town of St. Pierre, killing all but three of 30,000 residents that lived there. In March 1980, Mount St. Helens in Washington erupted with a series of pyroclastic flows that killed 57 people. These pyroclastic flow eruptions are not that incredibly unusual and in the last hundred years, we've had a number of them in Mexico and the Philippines and elsewhere that have literally killed thousands of people. Let's take a look at some photos for a better explanation. This is the pyroclastic ash flow and ash cloud from Mount St. Helens when it erupted in 1980. On the right, you can see the pyroclastic cloud going downhill, the ash uh, just going up into the air. This eruption blew down forests for miles, heavy uh, evergreen forests with big trees were just pushed down like toothpicks. People don't understand the force of these pyroclastic dust clouds. The force of the pyroclastic flow that hit this area literally knocked down buildings. But what's kind of amazing is even the rebar was bent over by the force of this blast. 
in the background, you can see a hill and barely see on it. There's trees that have just been blown over. The force is just incredible. What's probably the most famous eruption of this type was the eruption that occurred in 79 AD, which buried two towns, Pompeii and Herculaneum. These are plaster casts of the residents. They were buried in the ash, and literally as the archaeologists come through, they find these voids, fill them with plaster, and end up with a plaster cast of the human that was incinerated by the ash. And yet there are still people living within the shadow of this dangerous volcano. And it's not something that just happens, oh, once every 50,000 years or so. This is something that happens every 10 or 15 years uh, someplace on the globe. We just don't hear about it because generally when a devastating eruption occurs in a developing nation, it's just not news in the developed nations. Next, we'll talk about kimberlite eruptions. Of course, kimberlite is the type of eruption that brings diamond from way deep in the Earth's mantle up to the surface where we can find them. Kimberlite eruptions are small but very powerful volcanic eruptions caused by the rapid ascent of kimberlite magma, a type of intrusive igneous rock that comes from deep in the earth and rises abruptly up to the surface. Kimberlite is a gas-rich, ultramafic type of, of igneous rock that contains minerals olivine, diopside, serpentine, calcite, and minor amounts of apatite, magnetite, chromite, garnet, and of course, diamond. Kimberlites are thought to rise through a series of fissures in the rock to form a vertical pipe-like formation. And the pipes penetrate all the way to the surface of the earth. Unlike other kinds of eruptions, kimberlite magnum does not collect in a subsurface reservoir like a magma chamber prior to the eruption. Uh, these eruptions are rare, and the last known kimberlite eruption on the surface of the Earth occurred more than 25 million years ago. Branches that form during the kimberlite eruptions are made up of the kimberlite as it's rising, and, but also rips off some of the surrounding wall rock and brings it up with it. When eroded, kimberlite volcanoes expose a, a vertical funnel-shaped pipe that resembles a volcanic caldera. Diamonds in deep rocks that intersect the rising pipe may be carried along with the magma to the surface. Now, one thing I do want to say is not all kimberlites have diamonds in them. It's possible to have diamonds in a kimberlite. It's possible to have a few diamonds, not enough to be economic. And it's possible to have enough diamonds that it is economic to mine. Let's take a look at some photos and diagrams for further explanation. This is a diamond in its original kimberlite host rock. You can see by looking at the host rock that it's a bunch of bits of broken pieces. Kimberlite is often a breccia. Many diamond mines working these kimberlite pipes often are constructed to conform to the shape of the pipe and take as little a wall rock as possible. Finally, we're going to talk about fissure vents. And the eruptions are related to them. They're sometimes called monogenic volcanic fields. They bury large regions with volcanic rocks like basalt. The individual vents and volcanoes each only erupt once, but the fields themselves can experience many eruptions over a long period of time. It's these types of eruptions that carry basalt from deep in the earth that can have gemstones in it. These types of volcanic uh, materials, the, the lava and the uh, volcanic rocks that are brought up, um, can carry uh, sapphires and zircons and a lot of different types of gem crystals. And there are sources of gems in Australia, in Southeast Asia, and in Montana in the U.S. Volcanoes come in all different types of shapes and sizes. Some are dangerous and some are extremely dangerous. All active volcanoes present hazards that can be dangerous to nearby communities. In the most extreme cases, they can cause planet-wide extinction events. It's essential to understand the risks associated with volcanoes and to heed the warnings from governmental agencies and geologists when signs begin to come together that a new eruption is probably coming. It may seem that the government is being overly cautious, but volcanoes can be very unpredictable and unexpectedly destructive. 
Now some volcanoes can create or carry gem deposits and I did do a, a video on that if you want to learn more about how volcanic rocks can lead or volcanoes and volcanic rocks can lead to the formation of gem deposits. I'm going to put a link to that video right up here so you can take a look at it if you're interested. Volcanoes and volcanic rocks can also lead to the formation of valuable metallic mineral deposits. And I did a video on the relationship of volcanoes to gold deposits, and I'm going to put a link to that video right here. Now, most of my videos are about prospecting for and finding gold. And if you want to learn more about how to find gold for yourself, I wrote a book about that. It's called Fistful of Gold, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my book right now. So let me tell you a little bit more about my book. Um, it's called Fistful of Gold, and I wrote it because I want you to be able to go out and find for yourself Fistful of Gold. And uh, you can see that it's a, an encyclopedia with all kinds of information, pictures, and that sort of thing. It's not in color, but uh, uh, color would have cost me a lot more to have printed, and so the book would have cost a lot more. It's for sale on Amazon, and you can pick it up. I'll put a link in the description below. I also serve as the editor for a, a prospecting magazine. It's ICMJ's Prospecting and Mining Journal. And honestly, you should check that out. We've got stories uh, and information, legal stuff, everything you know to increase your skills as a prospector. I write articles in this every month and a lot of other very experienced prospectors contribute to the magazine as well. So check the magazine out. Also, I have a website and the website is uh, at nevadaoutbackgems.com. I'll put a link for it in the description below. But there's gobs of information there that you will find useful in your prospecting efforts. Finally, I want to say that I really appreciate your comments and thoughts and even a positive criticism. Don't come on there and just toss out insults because I'll just delete your comments. But if you've got uh, helpful things to say and questions to ask, do write and, and put those in the comments because I answer my comments to people and uh, you'll hear from me in, in, you know, in, in responding to you. Uh, so if you've enjoyed this video and you like what you see and you're interested in uh, finding out more, well then sign up, subscribe, and hit the, uh, the notification bell so they'll let you know when I post new videos. And, you know, like it and share it if, again, you, you see stuff that you really are excited about. And I'll be coming out with lots more new videos. And so we'll see you again real soon.